Terry Nelson. I'm originally from Michigan, born in Texas, but lived most of my life in Michigan. My wife and I moved to Dover in 2005, and I got a job with Granite State College as a consultant, which is partly what allowed me to write this book because the job entailed me having 16 districts as my responsibility, almost like a salesman with territory. So I got a chance to do a lot of wandering around the state and um, encounter you know, a lot of different historical sites, things that were unusual, things that were tucked away. And so after I was a consultant, I got a job at Timberlane for a couple of years as a administrator. And then my last six years were as a uh, assistant principal at Southside Middle School in Manchester. And again, coming to and from these places, I encountered a lot of interesting and out of the way sites that I thought might make a good book. The kernel of the idea, my wife and I, about oh, seven or eight years ago, when I said, you know, I might want to write a book about some of this stuff, we bought little, little, little moleskin type uh, booklets and we started just jotting down things we saw and the dates we saw them and things, ideas that might be something worth putting in the book. So it had been an idea for seven, eight, nine years. And three years ago was when I really, after I retired, is when I started putting myself into putting it together. When I was still a consultant, I was working in the uh, Windham schools. They were about to build a high school there. And I had read an article in the Globe that said the project was going to be held up because a, an old causeway had been discovered along where they wanted to put the access road to the school. So I was at a meeting with some other uh, Windham employees and one of them said, I, I can't believe they're going to hold up the whole project for a pile of rocks. And, you know, obviously she, people were anxious to get that school built. Um, so that turned into one of my stories, basically, because the efforts to, to save it, uh, the controversy it caused, because it did delay the project, it cost the district you know, some money. And so that was one of the first ones. Uh, and at that point, I still wasn't thinking of a book, but then I started encountering other things, and I thought, there's a lot of out-of-the-way interesting things here that might make a good book that are things that are not known, or at least not known outside their own community, and so deserve the telling um, in a general, in, in the book format. Another one of my stories is about the uh, fish houses in Northampton. My wife and I had driven by those dozens of times, taking rides up and down Ocean Boulevard. They looked like, just like bathhouses. And then we discovered one day that they were fish houses, um, used by fishermen for, since perhaps 200 years ago to store equipment. And then it turned out there's a lot of backstories with them, because of what I want, what I have in my book, what I hope to show are a lot of stories within the stories. So not only what were the fish houses, but as it turns out, a very famous sculptor uh, used the fish houses for a studio. Um, and then in that same area, I learned that that area is called Little Boar's Head, which had a, um, a very elite summer colony there. And one day, there was a woman there uh, who had Alice Hobson, who would have concerts in the summer, like at uh, Tanglewood. But one time, she had a concert uh, to benefit the USS Squalus, a submarine that went down and was part of a very famous and dangerous and cutting edge uh, submarine rescue. So I learned a lot of these backstories by first just getting interested in, in this case, the fish houses. I wanted, number one, to have a lot of backstories, and the one about Australia is a backstory about town pounds, which are scattered throughout the state. And then I also um, wanted to bring in other parts of the country or different parts of the state. You know, like, turns out, well, Henry Dearborn is connected with the city of Chicago, for example. Um, you know, this, uh, this Australian uh, pound keeper posted a pound, impounding notice in his local newspaper. It's the only impounding notice that I was able to find to show how the town pound system worked, even though Hampshire had dozens. So I was able to put that in there. Plus then I got to tell a little bit of the story about this pound keeper, it turned out was um, born in England at age 19. He was arrested for stealing cloth and he was what they called transported, you know, to Australia for seven years. And but he, did, he stayed there and he became pound keeper and he became the jail keeper. He was very successful. But so a little story that's not directly related to, related to the seacoast, but it's related to the town pounds and it's a good side story to to find about something else that people might be interested in. The, 
the Henry Dearborn story that the general, who I had never heard of, uh, there's a, in Nottingham Square, it's, it's a beautiful spot just north of the entrance to Pawtuckaway. There's a lot of large monuments put up by the Daughters of the Revolution there. This is a small monument, probably 18 by 18, tucked by the side of the road. Talks about a march that he did with militia after hearing about uh, the Concord, you know, Concord and Lexington attacks, and he marched with 60 men down overnight to to muster with the uh, with the rest of the, uh, the troops. And that that led to a much wider story, but uh, it's something that would be easily overlooked because as you drive through on Route 156 going north. You don't, you'd have to be looking over to the side down amongst the weeds to see this little monument. So that that's, is an example of that. It's a, a little monument that led to actually one of my largest stories. When we first moved here, my wife and I, we would take our dogs walking over there. Uh, probably as far back as 10 or 12 years ago, and I thought this is a great spot to walk. And I'd noticed the old bear cage there, but it would pretty much had been not attended to, and I didn't think much about it. Then I went back there a couple of years later and seen that this uh, young Boy Scout, David Brackett, had, uh, at the age of 13, for his Eagle Project, had uh, improved it and he restored the bear cage, put up signage, and I, and I realized, well, this, I had no idea this was all there. And so I started to, to research that. Um, again, because of my railway enthusiasm, the old car barn there that's now a, you know, a liquor store, that intrigued me as well. And, um, and then I actually learned uh, that the, uh, there's a garage across the street, uh, Bill Stowell Racing, it's called Central Park Garage. I, I asked him about, well, how'd you come up with that name? And he said, well, I just, when I moved here and opened my business, I wanted to find a good name, so I just researched it. So I wondered, well, that's interesting. What is there there? So, I started talking to people. Uh, Frank Kennedy at the Summer for Historical Society is one of the curators there that's interested in that. And so we visited it and we talked about it. And they have a wealth of photographs. You know, as you know, um, the cover of the book is one of their photographs. Um, so, and then as I got into the story, I just said, thought, well, there's, there's a lot there. And, and one of the side stories of that, and one of the stories within the story is the woman who owned the railway, the horse railway before, uh, Burgett bought it, Mary Dow, as it turns out, was a very remarkable woman and extremely accomplished. And I spent some time talking about her because she's really pretty much unknown around here, and yet she was she was an important person in, in, the, uh, in, in, in Dover. But one thing I'll tell you, you about her without giving away the rest is that she apparently in 1887 demanded and was given the right to vote. And obviously that's 33 years before suffrage, and so she could very well be the first woman in New Hampshire to have voted. There's a lot more to her, but she was an amazing woman, so that's sort of the central story, central park backstory that I thought was was uh, worth telling and letting people know about who Mary Dow was and what she had done in her life. My favorites is a it's, it's a little story. It, it's uh, it's set in Madbury, and uh, along Back River Road, there's a monument in the middle of a field. It's a monument to the Layton family, who were some of the earliest settlers here. Buried there, flat on the the monument's like a small Washington monument, maybe six feet tall. But on, laying on the ground was a gravestone for this young man named John Layton, who died in 1825. And it turns out he di he had moved to Salem because I think there's a lot of jobs and excitement there, and somehow he got word that some of his family members back here were ill, so he came back to tend them, and they got better, and he passed away at the age of 19. And then I walked over one day and, and found out, saw the gravestone, which actually has an epitaph that was uh, put on it by his friends from Salem, who brought him back here for the for his burial in the service, and so it's, it's a touching story, and you wouldn't know it unless you got out of the car and checked it out. And, so, and it's a lovely spot, you know, you're overlooking the little bay, and um, it's in the middle of the meadow, and the farmer whose land is on, was he was he it was deeded that he had to take care of that plot as long as he owned the land, so he's done a wonderful job keeping the plot up, so it's mowed and kept neat, and there's an access path mowed to it. So it is a little thing that you could drive by and then if they read the book they might stop by and just kind of get a little feel for, for that story. It's, it's a touching story, it's something that's not well known, but this is, you know, a young local man, Dover born, who sacrificed everything uh, for his family 
And so I thought that's the kind of story that needed to be told. So that is actually one of my favorite ones. Well, it's available on Amazon, and uh, apparently Bards and Noble. Um, a lot of the local retailers, uh, Tugboat Alley, for example, in Portsmouth has them. Um, I believe the Flower Room here in Dover is, is going to be carrying them, and some other places in Dover as well. So they're, they're out and about. Um, the Dover Library has a copy. I was pleased to hear that somebody had already checked it out, and that, was, that, that felt pretty good. I think that's actually somebody just taking it off the shelf and checking it out. They'd only had it for a couple of weeks. So. But it's, it's around. How about Amazon is, or Barnes & Noble, those places? I think the Woodman's going to be selling some. Uh, Summersworth Historical Society has some as well. So they're, they're around. <laughs>